Again, we're in Romans 8, and we're in verses 1 and 2 today. Boy, the way they were flipping their music, I thought they had another song. Man. After four and a half years, one day I'll get this right. I promise. We'll get, we'll get used to this. Let us hear now from the word of God. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Here ends our reading today from God's holy word. Let us go to him in a moment of prayer. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The music in the 8 a.m. service that that Deb and Ian played really uh, struck a chord with me. One of the songs they played asked the question, are you looking for hope tonight? And of course, we're here in the morning, and the question is, are you looking for hope tonight? today. Who's here looking for hope? We're we're all in this search for hope. And then this very last song that the band just played, talking about the struggles in life and, and wondering if we were all alone. But the truth of the matter is that Jesus was always there. And then through all of that, I'm also reminded by what Pastor Chris frequently says when we gather to this communion table. Come as you are. Come from where you are, right here, right now, to this table. The invitation is for now. For you see, the the mistake we often make in our own lives that our friends make, that even though we know Jesus, we trip and make this mistake. Well, I've got to get my life back in order before I get back to Jesus. Right? Or even when it's the first time, I'm not ready to go before God because I've done some messed up stuff I've got to make right first. And the truth is, that's that's not how God works. And and see, Paul writes earlier in his letter in chapter 5, you hear me say it almost every Sunday, but while we were yet sinners, when we deserved death, when we deserved wrath, when we deserved God's judgment, Christ died for you. Proving God's love for you. When we didn't deserve it, when we didn't have our stuff figured out, when we hadn't made ourselves righteous, Christ died for us and he gave us his righteousness so that we would be right before God. And that's what Paul writes here in these first two verses. And and the order in which he writes is important. It's important for us so that it can be solidified, so that it can just become nature and second nature to us in how we live, right? He, he writes first that we are justified there in the first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means we are justified. The verdict has been ruled and we are found not guilty, not just in that moment, but forevermore. We are justified before God. We have legal standing before him to stand righteous, and we stand in Christ's righteousness. The second thing that he writes, he says, after we've been justified, we begin transformation. Yes, the call is come as you are from where you are, and it's okay to not be okay, but guess what? Christ won't leave you there. He calls us into growth, into sanctification that is being made holy day by day, a grace in process. Not so that we can get right with God, but because we have our salvation, we can do it with joy. And and this is why it's important, because we often... We often do it the other way around. Even after 
even after we have been converted and, and we've had this new birth, we have this forgetfulness about us. The same forgetfulness that the Israelites had about them. We are a forgetful people who need to be reminded often. Yeah. It's why Jesus said at the table, do this in remembrance of me. And so we come to it every week to hear Jesus say that again. Do this in remembrance of me because we're forgetful people. And so we try the other way around. Well, I've got to get my life back together before I can get back to God. If we could clean ourselves up and present ourselves before God as holy and righteous, there's no need for Jesus. The truth is, the law reveals our sinfulness. The law points out that we are sinners. This law of Moses isn't something we can attain on our own. But it points out our sinfulness. No, you see, justification comes before sanctification. Being right with God always comes before doing right for God. No matter where or what station you are in your life, that is the order. We are made right with God, and then we can begin doing right for God. See, in verse 1, this is how Paul lays it out. In verse 1, he gives us a precious statement of justification. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And immediately follows it up in verse 2 with a description of practical transformation for our lives. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. It's funny that Paul uses the word law here. Now, when Paul uses the word law, he, he usually has three different meanings depending on the context in which he's writing. And in this context, he's not talking about a legal law, but he is talking about law as in power and authority. And the law of sin and death, it's the power or the impulse that is at work in our body to make us or to draw us to evil. But in Christ, Oh, but in Christ, he tells us, we are given victory over this power. For the power that raised Christ from the dead is the power that resides in you. And that power has a name, and its name is the spirit of life. The spirit of God, the Holy Spirit itself is living in you. Yes. This is the gospel truth. This is the implication of our salvation, that we will move through sanctification. See, law means power and authority. And so this sin has the power that leads us to death. Sin has the power that leads us to death, and it rules over our lives before we came to Christ. But you see, it's the Spirit of God that has the power to lead us to life. For when Jesus talks about us having to go through this new birth, a second birth, he talks about being born not of the flesh, but of the Spirit. Because it's the spirit that invades our hearts and brings us new life in Christ. Not your own works. No, that new life came from God. Every Christian has the spirit of life at work in them. And so because we are in Christ, that we are united with him. We have a pardon from sin. And this is what Paul writes. We have pardon from sin and power over sin. It no longer has dominion over us. Sin no longer rules our lives. 
Because being united to Christ in faith makes his righteousness ours. Right? So, so here's how we understand this. This is what the Bible teaches, that when Jesus goes to the cross and he dies, that our sins are put on him. He takes them on, willfully takes on our sin and pays the penalty for our sin. He is our substitute. And while he hangs on that cross, he sheds his blood so that our sins are washed clean. And while our sins are put on him, he puts on us his righteousness. His righteousness is ours. So, and that is why when we stand before God, we have the legal standing of righteous, of justified. Because when God sees you, he sees his beloved son. Amen. And. That's why Paul keeps writing, because that's verse one. And verse two, that being united in Christ in faith makes his power and authority over sin ours through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so in our lives, each of us, we have different particular sins that that we struggle with, that we are dealing with at different given moments in our life, particular sins that are attacking us that, that we feel begin weighing us down. And if you are going to have victory over particular sins in your life, you have to have confidence first that they are forgiven. The only sin you can defeat is a forgiven sin. Let me say that again. The only sin you can defeat is a forgiven sin. Right? So in Christ, we have confidence of no condemnation. That's what it says. There is therefore now no condemnation. It's you aren't, it doesn't say not condemned. It's not a singular moment in time. It's no condemnation. It's bigger than that. It's forevermore. But we're that forgetful people, aren't we? We often are our biggest critic. We have that self-talk in our own heads, in our own ears. We let the devil join in to that chorus, begin telling us that we're worthless, that we're not worth it, that we'll never be good enough. And And we keep hearing that over and over, and so we feel that, well, when we were converted, we were forgiven, and we, didn't, we got no condemnation for that, but, but I've messed up since then, so now I have to get my life back in order before I can go back to God. Folks, this isn't a game of hokey pokey. You don't put yourself in and then take yourself back out, and then put yourself back in and then take yourself back out. That's not how this works. If you could lose your salvation, you would have already done it. And so Paul here is saying this, have the confidence that all of your sins, past, present, and future, have been forgiven. And then, then, as John Piper says, you have have been empowered, you have the power of the Holy Spirit to go into radical warfare of transformation. Because folks, it's a battle. To kill all the sin in your life is a battle, and it is not one that is won by sitting back in your recliner and waiting for it to disappear. This is a battle that calls us to our knees. This is a battle that calls us to put on the full armor of God. For you see, Paul writes in verse 13, later here in chapter 8, he says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The only sin we can put to death is a forgiven sin. And so, Dear Christian, go with confidence. 
with full assurance of pardon that all sins, past, present, and future have been forgiven so that you have the power of the Holy Spirit who resides in you. And here's the truth. Power of the Holy Spirit greater than the power of sin and death. If it were not so, he would not have told us. And so here Paul is in verse 2 saying that the Spirit is now enabling us, empowering us to serve God in a new, free, and joyful way. That it's, it's not this begrudgingly, well, I hope this is good enough. It's as if we go before the court and we are given two options. One in which we, we get to go spend the next 60 days and, and the court's going to observe how we live and then come back and determine a judgment upon us. Or the one that God gives us that says no condemnation. Which one sets you free? The not guilty. You don't have to prove yourself to God to get God, but it's because now that you have God, you have Jesus, you have the power of the Spirit, oh, don't slump over, dear Christian. Walk tall with boldness, with strength, with confidence, because you are justified. You don't have to walk fearfully to get justified. So you see, we fight sin not in our lives, not to earn salvation, but because we have it. And now Christ rules our hearts. He is our master. So don't live in fear, trying to earn your salvation. That's not the law of the spirit of life. Hear these words from scripture. This is what it's like to have the spirit. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that, that we didn't have to clean ourselves up first before coming to you, but that because you are a great God and because of your great love, you sent Jesus as our substitute to be our righteousness, to be our master. You sent the Holy Spirit so that we could have the power to live faithfully. Lord, it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. We're still going to struggle. So remind us daily that you are with us always, always. For it's this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.